thank you so much, uh, Professor Wadley, and thanks uh, to all of you for organizing this event and for inviting me to Syracuse today uh, to meet with all of you to talk about issues relating to Kashmir. It's so impressive to see that uh, Syracuse has such a critical mass of students and faculty, former students, who are doing such meaningful and engaged research uh, and projects relating to uh, contemporary issues in Kashmir. So it's really inspiring to be here and I'm looking forward to our conversations today. Um, my talk today is entitled Everyday Violence, Institutional Denial, and Struggles for Justice in Kashmir. Um, I'll start with an opening anecdote. On International Human Rights Day in 2009, a mass demonstration was held at Jamia Masjid, the historic mosque located in the center of the town of Shopian in Kashmir Valley in the Indian-occupied region of the contested Himalayan border zone between India and Pakistan. Abdul Rashid Dalal, the president of a local community organization known as the Majlis e Mushwarat, stood in the arched doorway at the top of the mosque stairs wearing a long gray Kashmiri woolen farin and scarf. Speaking through a microphone, he addressed hundreds of Kashmiri boys and men crowded in the streets and sidewalks below who listened to his speech with rapt attention in the freezing December rain. Like the other speakers on Human Rights Day, Dalal spoke about the unresolved crime that had shaped every aspect of life in the town for the past six months, the rape and murder of two Shopian women during the previous summer. Kashmiris across Kashmir Valley, widely believing state security forces to be responsible for the crime, had launched massive protests against the state's refusal to adequately investigate the crime and to bring the perpetrators to justice. Invoking on this day the language of human rights, President DeLaw framed the crimes of Shopian as a moral affront to humanity and issued a powerful moral indictment of the Indian state. How do they hold their heads high before the world community, he asked in elegant rhetorical Urdu, speaking about the Indian state. I say their heads should hang in shame. The crowd responded emphatic, emphatically in unison, shame, shame. They're trying to create illusions in our eyes so that the issue leaves our minds, but we have to demonstrate that unless the culprits are brought to book, we will not rest or lie low. Dalal then addressed the Indian state directly. We told them that we have thousands of doubts and reservations against you. We have seen how you have functioned all along. Your job is to suppress facts, to keep people busy for a while, for a long while, until people's passions cool down, until they get busy with their livelihoods and forget in the process that anything has happened at all. He paused gravely. Hold your heads in shame, he admonished the state because your legal system only manages to cover up such cases, but not provide justice. The Modulus is only one of a series of significant local justice-seeking initiatives uh, that have emerged at the community level in recent years in the context of the ongoing popular resistance movement against Indian state authority in Kashmir Valley. So in my talk today, I'm going to focus on some of these uh, communities of local actors that have been operating quite powerfully across the recent period of protest and rebellion in Kashmir Valley, particularly from 2008 to 2011. These justice-seeking communities are doing the very important work of challenging the political order by claiming popular legitimacy and jurisdictional authority to produce legal claims as well as political demands in the name of law and justice. In the process of doing so, they are articulating and negotiating new forms of local justice that are inflected by local histories of protest and struggle and they're formed through engagements with other actors within the locale, but also transnational actors beyond it. Uh, the talk today is part of a larger ethnographic anthropological research project that I've been carrying out across the last uh, four or five years with my colleague Bruce Hoffman, who's a criminologist at Ohio University. And the project is framed within a law and society uh, perspective that draws on primarily the anthropology of law and legal orders to consider the work of justice institutions as they emerge on the ground. I'll just say a couple of words about the kind of conceptual framework for the talk before we move into it more. For the project, we're drawing on a conceptual model of global legal pluralism to argue for the importance of taking seriously alternative normative orders that are grounded in everyday life, considering what locally situated justice initiatives might look like as hybrid and vernacular forms within a context of globalization. So the project builds on the work in particular of legal scholar Paul Schiff Behrman, who offers what he calls a cosmopolitan pluralist model of jurisdiction. 
And in developing this model, uh, Behrman describes a world of overlapping what he calls normative communities, various legal and quasi-legal regimes that can include state institutions, transnational networks, subnational bodies, community groups, that all claim competing jurisdictional authority in any particular instance based on competing political and moral priorities and commitments. So when Behrman writes about jurisdiction and the way that I use the concept of jurisdiction in this talk, he's writing about the circumstances under which a juridical body can assert authority to adjudicate or apply its legal norms to a dispute. So he argues that assertions of jurisdiction and jurisdictional authority can and should be viewed as meaning-producing cultural acts that carry rhetorical force and moral power. These claims about the law are not only about the law, but they're also about the moral and the political. So in this way, contestations over jurisdictional authority, the kind that we see increasingly emerging in Kashmir, are also contestations over community membership and belonging, borders and boundaries, citizenship and statehood, and self-identification. So this model is instructive, especially in this attention to the generative potency of jurisdictional claims. And it's important to emphasize that such jurisdictional claims not only challenge and counter the state, but also produce alternative visions about the future. This is especially important when we're looking at how justice initiatives specifically emerge under conditions of conflict and contestation. So in the talk today, I'm developing Behrman's primarily cultural analysis of the law by adding power into it and exploring how jurisdictional communities are emerging within the lived context of occupational authority, militarized governance, and institutionalized impunity in Kashmir. And I'll particularly then be talking about how these local communities are engaging with international justice institutions and initiatives in their everyday lives as they negotiate different justice-seeking pathways, as they establish linkages, for example, with transnational groups, or as they call for public trials to challenge state authority. Okay? So I'll get into this further then by talking a little bit about the context of militarization in Kashmir and situating in particular the Shopian case within that uh, of 2009. That's the focus of my talk today. And then I will ethnographically discuss some of these different justice-seeking community groups focusing on youth street protesters, Kashmiri Bar Association, human rights lawyers, civil society activists, and village elders, that each differ in how they define and assert their jurisdictional authority, how they frame their jurisdictional appeals, and how they enact their jurisdictional practice. The Shopian crime and cover-up that I'm going to be talking about today and that our film later is going to be focusing on as well is not an isolated incident, but rather the most recent in a long history of state-sponsored violence, including gendered violence, that has occurred in and through conditions of militarization in Kashmir Valley, especially over the last 20 to 25 years. As is well known, in the late 1980s, Kashmiris took up arms in a mass popular movement for Azadi, or self-determination, against the Indian state which they have long perceived as an, occupy, an occupying force lacking legal legitimacy and political authority in the Kashmiri homeland. Since that time, the Indian state has maintained its governing authority in the region through the presence of a massive apparatus of more than half a million state security forces. This includes police, military, and paramilitary personnel with unrestricted power to carry out their operations against civilians. The forces are authorized and empowered through the passage of a series of special emergency legislations. The most notable among these is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, AFSPA, but there are others as well, that have given rise to widespread human rights violations and abuses throughout the region. This includes disappearance, extrajudicial killings, rape, and torture. Uh, the emergency legislations authorizing militarization have significantly shaped the social and legal landscape of the region across this period of time giving rise to a culture of impunity that's pervasive throughout the local justice institutions and opening space for widespread cover-up of state crimes. Although the armed struggle declined across the 1990s, the emergency legislations, AFSPA and others, and with them these long-standing patterns of state repression, lack of accountability, and institutionalized denial of justice have endured until the present day. And Kashmir Valley, even today, continues to be one of the most uh, heavily, heavily militarized places in the world. 
Now, in recent years, a new phase of political protest has emerged as the early violent militant movement for independence has transformed into a nonviolent resistance movement that combines primarily calls for independence, also with demands for human rights, law, and justice. Since 2008, this most recent phase, which is sometimes called the Second Revolution, has been characterized by various forms of unarmed resistance, with masses of people coming out into the streets to make claims for freedom as well as justice through a variety of different protest strategies, including rallies, demonstrations, and marches, other forms of protest as well. Through this peaceful phase of the revolution, Kashmiris pursuing cases of state violence have struggled to engage with the formal legal system in the state while also working to establish alternative forums for the pursuit of justice as part of their project of challenging the state. So this phase of the protest movement has opened space for the emergence of these new forms of community organization and uh, mobilization, such that multiple community actors are claiming popular legitimacy and jurisdictional authority to make claims for law and justice on behalf of Kashmiri communities in different ways. So let's turn to the Shopian case as one particular instance of state violence and den denial of justice that also has broader legal, political, and moral implications across society as a whole. Can I ask how many of you in the audience are familiar with the Shopian case? Is this something that you've heard of or read about to some degree? Okay, that looks like about half the audience. Um, on the morning of May 30th, 2009, the bodies of two young Kashmiri women who were sisters-in-law named Asiya and Nilafar were discovered in a shallow riverbed in um, a very highly militarized area uh, located within immediate view of four separate security camps on the periphery of the town of Shopian. Uh, this image on the screen now is an image of the site where one of the women's bodies were found and you can see one of the state security camps um, in the immediate vicinity. There are three others uh, encircling this area in a ring. And the women's bodies were found about a kilometer and a half away from one another, one on this side of the bridge and the other a little bit further down the river. You can also note the height of the river here in this slide pretty clearly. This slide was taken just a few weeks after the women's bodies were found. Shopian residents, seeing the battered and disheveled condition of the two women's bodies at the time of their discovery, immediately claimed that the women had been raped and murdered. But the local police force did not initially treat the incident as a crime, refusing to file a first incident report, an FIR, and launch a full investigation following the initial request of the families in the hours and then the days after the discovery of the bodies. These various circumstances, the condition and location of the bodies, as well as the state's apparent refusal to follow formal channels of investigation, led many Kashmiris to believe that the police were attempting a cover-up of a crime that had been perpetrated by agents that were associated with one of the camps, although the exact identities and the affiliations of those responsible for the double rape and murder remained unknown. So they were loosely identified as men in uniform affiliated with one of these different kinds of camps. The state's failure to properly investigate the situation prompted massive protest across the valley in Shopian and also more widely across the valley throughout the summer and then sporadically in the fall and continuing into the winter with civilian protesters combining calls for Kashmiri independence and self-determination with demands for justice and accountability within the legal system. In June, the state, in response to popular pressure, launched a commission of inquiry led by a retired J&K High Court judge named Muzaffar John. And this John Commission published its final report in mid-July, finding that criminal activity had occurred and recommending formal prosecution of four particular police officers who had been responsible for criminal negligence in the way in which they had uh, mishandled the crime. The police officers then were arrested a few days after the John Commission report came out. The John Commission report did not, however, indicate the identities of the perpetrators. In September, the JNK state government handed the case over to the Delhi-based Central Bureau of Investigation, the CBI, which is India's premier investigatory body, Delhi-based, for further investigation. And in December of 2009, after about four months of investigation, the CBI completed its work and submitted its report to the j &K High Court, finding that the two women had not been raped and had not been murdered, but rather had died due to accidental drowning. Now, the CBI report itself is a, is a fascinating document, um, and it focuses through its language and through its 
framing of the, of the crimes, it focuses on three different objectives. First, it goes through a process of dismissing and discrediting the accumulated uh, body of evidence, forensic evidence and eyewitness evidence that had been collected during the prior stages of investigation. It dismisses and discredits that. Second, it discredits the existing body of local knowledge or popular knowledge about the crimes and how they had occurred, stories about what had happened to the women. And third, it criminalizes community members who had been making claims against the state on behalf of the victims' families. The CBI report is, in essence, a charge sheet, a 50-page charge sheet that brings formal criminal charges, primarily criminal conspiracy, but other kinds of charges against 13 local community members, including doctors, um, local lawyers, and family members of the victims. So through pursuing these objectives, the CBI report draws on the authority of the central government to coercively deny any kinds of alternative understandings of the nature of the violence against the two fe uh, female victims, and it also silences any public efforts to make claims against the state in this case. So the CBI report, when it was released in December, effectively closed the door on possibilities for legal justice. So what I'd like to do now is turn to a kind of overview of four different uh, normative communities, or what I'm calling jurisdictional communities, that emerged to challenge the state's jurisdictional authority in this case, and that offered alternative kinds of understandings of the nature of the crime. Um, I'm going to start then with uh, youth street protesters, then turn to Kashmir Bar Association lawyers, civil society members, and a community of group of village elders called the Majlis. The first jurisdictional community, can you all read the slide? The first jurisdictional community then that I'll look at is youth street protesters. Um, after the events in Shopian, shops were shuttered uh, through calls for strikes in Shopian and then across Kashmir Valley more generally throughout the summer as people came out into the street to voice their um, anger uh, through mass rallies and protests and processions. Um, and amidst the intensified police and military presence in the streets, the street protest rapidly escalated into street clashes in urban warfare, including stone peltings, as primarily young men, their identities obscured with bandanas tied around their faces, hurled bricks and rocks at security force personnel who responded with cane charges, tear gas shots, and bullets fired into the air. And this is across the summer of 2009. These youth protesters who were pouring out into the streets to challenge the state claimed a kind of popular jurisdictional authority by emphasizing the importance of people's participation in any social movement or any kind of social response. So for these youth, street protests provided an alternative means of claiming and establishing authority and pressuring the state through public performance and claims making in a physical space that was outside of the state's coercive control. Youth protesters claimed that all other venues had been exhausted, that they had no other kind of formal or informal channels to pursue for legal redress in this case, and they advocated popular protest as a tactic, a strategy, a thought out strategy of registering popular frustration and anger at the state's refusal to administer justice. Their jurisdictional claims were explicitly politicized, and in their articulations of their form of the movement, they advocated um, they emphasize the continuities between the current nonviolent struggle and the militancy phase of the movement that had taken place in the 1990s. Okay. The second jurisdictional community then that mobilized in response to the Shopian case is the Kashmir Bar Association. This is the professional association of lawyers in Kashmir. Um, and they organized their mobilizations in response in different kinds of venues, including the courtrooms, as well as the streets. In the days following uh, the Shopian crimes in June and July, the Kashmir Bar Association launched their own independent inquiries into the circumstances surrounding the women's disappearances and their deaths, focusing on public knowledge about what had transpired. So what this actually meant was that in the weeks following um, the, uh, the crimes, the Bar Association lawyers pursued independent inquiries that they um, took it upon themselves to, themselves to carry out. And this was very challenging for them because of the highly charged atmosphere in the capital city and in Shopian as well. 
these are the kinds of inquiries that they've been doing actually since the early 1990s. This has been the kind of project that the Kashmir Bar Association has been very committed to. In addition to carrying out these independent inquiries, they also engaged in public action through street protest in Srinagar City, calling for public trials that would be modeled on formal legal proceedings to establish alternative jurisdictional arenas for the adjudication of rights claims. So through all of their different efforts, through the inquiries and also through their calls for public trials, they claimed a form of constitutional jurisdiction, one that would be carried out in adherence with the formal legal procedure, but outside of state law. The KBA consistently framed Shopian as an institutionalized denial of justice, a human rights violation, this is the kind of language that they used, and even a crime against humanity, situated within the larger context of legal exceptionalism. They continually drew attention to AFSPA and other emergency laws and institutionalized impunity in Kashmir. So through these kinds of framings, they established space for an alternative jurisdiction of justice, one that would adhere in form and procedure to the established criminal law of the land, but that would operate outside of the realm of state authority and military control. They were still interested in using forms of law as it is known, but they were interested in pursuing forms of law that would operate outside of realms of state coercion. Their framing of law in this context carried significant political implications, right? When they're talking about the law, they're also making larger political commentaries as they situated the Shopian event within the larger context of contestations and even warfare over sovereignty and self-determination in the state. Okay. The third community group then is the civil society organizations. Uh, and this would primarily include various local NGOs, uh, in particular lawyers and activists that are associated with one kind of loosely formed network of NGOs called the Coalition of Civil Society in Jammu and Kashmir. The civil society organizations issued powerful appeals, appeals for international intervention after Shopian, especially after the release of the CBI report. This is when they especially started doing a lot of their work. Building on the jurisdictional authority of global justice regimes, these groups sought to investigate, document, and raise awareness about the Shopian case. But rather than trying the case, as the KBA lawyers had done, kind of using formal, familiar concepts of law, they addressed tactics and strategies for making appeals to the international community. And in so doing this, they claimed a form of international jurisdiction uh, by invoking possibilities of international intervention in this particular case, and then by extension in the case of the Kashmir dispute more generally. Their efforts constituted a form of moral indictment of the state's failures to live up to the standards of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. And they justified their approach through intellectualized arguments, reflexively addressing issues like the complexities of civil society mobilizations in Kashmir across South Asia more broadly. They also talked about the importance of exposing what one of the leading lawyers, Parvez Imrose, calls the contradictions of the state. Right? So through these intellectual arguments, when he talks about the contradictions of the state, he means specifically the illegitimacies of state law in this context and the impossibilities of seeking and receiving state justice under conditions of occupation. They also issued strong demands for an international people's tribunal. This was kind of their aspiration in relation to the Shopian case, and they conceptualized it as a documentation project that would highlight the failures of the state to provide justice for an international audience. Uh, the final normative community then is the Modulus e Mushwarit, the group that I opened the talk about. Uh, this is a Shopian-based consultative committee of male community elders that was established at the time of the woman's death specifically to pursue justice in the case. And this one is Shopian-based. The modulus concentrated on the goal of legal justice for victims' families, and they explicitly espoused a kind of political neutrality that enabled them to ultimately achieve an influence that's rarely seen outside of separatist political parties in Kashmir. In all of their actions, the modulus leadership countered the state's interpretation of the case through the presentation of common sense evidence, emphasizing factors that everyone knew to be true. So in this way, the modulus claimed community jurisdiction based on local understandings and popular forms of knowledge about the circumstances of the crime. Foregrounding their role as elders in the community, they positioned themselves as local leaders whose legitimacy derived from the support of the victim's families, the support of the people of Shopian, 
and also their responsibility, exer a responsible exercise of leadership during the somewhat chaotic days following the crime itself. They also emphasize their ability to exert discipline and control in the absence of effective practices of state governance over the local population by talking about their success in channeling local unrest and youth frustration into forms of nonviolent protest. So in these ways, they claimed a community-based form of jurisdictional authority to fill the role of the state that was perceived to be absent uh, with their alternative legal and moral order. I'll just make a few concluding remarks then. Uh, we've been looking at the Shopian case and social responses to it as a kind of critical event in which differently situated uh, Kashmiri organizations are making overlapping forms of jurisdictional claims to contest and to resist state oppression. These jurisdictional claims are themselves vibrant and generative moments of law in the making, which means that they are opening up space for questioning the definition and enforcements of rights the meanings and implications of juridical alternatives for seeking justice, the legitimacy of various sites of adjudication inside and outside of the state, and also the best ways to bring about political change. These alternative formulations of law, ultimately what they're talking about and establishing space for is law, are emerging in a space in between the local and the global as these various normative communities are trying to figure out whether and how to position themselves as transnational social actors and international law stakeholders with their own claims about rights and entitlements against the state. So I wanna emphasize why these claims and contestations matter. This is a context of longstanding state illegitimacy. It's a context in which citizens are living under conditions of intensive militarization and impunity where they do not have faith in state institutions, and where they're struggling to find alternative ways to use law and to use it as a political resource. So given this, calls for international intervention, calls for things like public trials and tribunals, suggest powerful forms of collective imagination of global justice, not only in the adjudication of the Shopian case, but also in the pursuit of a legal and political resolution to the Kashmir dispute more generally. Here we see that international justice is collectively imagined as a space of global conscience, a political, legal and political theater for shaming the state and exposing its contradictions to the international community with the ultimate aspiration of bringing, out, uh, bringing about political transformation and change. The case directs our attention to how law matters as a crucial site of hope in this form of struggle. Over months, these groups encountered one another and did the very difficult work of negotiating their boundaries in relation to one another and in relation to the state through a dialogic process that as it was going on opened up space for discussion and debate about motivations and strategies and aspirations. A process that gave rise not really to a common platform of resistance but to a common project of hope. For law as we see in this case is nothing else if not a space of hope. Law can act as a tool of occupation and oppression by institutionalizing and legitimizing state power and authority, but it can also act as a mechanism of protest and resistance, inspiring hope by giving rise to new forms of legal advocacy and legal consciousness. So if, as Paul schiff Behrman reminds us, jurisdiction refers to the ability to speak as a community, then these various normative communities may assert their jurisdictional power by seizing the language of law and justice and articulating potentially powerful alternative moral and political visions of future worlds. Within a transnational context, it's true that state lawgivers might maintain their hold on the violence of coercive power and the power of coercive violence, but it's also true that states do not have a monopoly on the establishment and enforcement of their legal regimes, and that alternative normative visions open opportunities for non-state actors such as these to subvert the logic of the state by offering different visions of what a just society might look like and by calling forth new possibilities of resistance, liberation, and freedom. Thanks. talk about it uh, in the beginning, at the very end of your paper, you talk about uh, the kind of language of law and justice, this kind of, uh, this, this law that is used in, or this, this language that is used in different ways by the four different groups. 
where does the where does that language come from? That is to say, uh, as as you know, I was there in whenever it was ninety four ninety five, and that language didn't exist uh, the way that it does now. So I'm wondering where uh, you know where that might have come from. These yeah. concepts and a language to support it. Right. I think that there are continuities to the period of the early to mid 90s. And as you're saying, it, it, there wasn't a strong kind of uh, framework of international human rights and humanitarian law. That, but it, it, it was there, but it wasn't as strong, certainly, as it is now. And this is one of the things that we've seen in the, in the past 10 years, and then increasing, I think, exponentially in the past five years, is really a, prolifer a proliferation of, um, I guess you could say, uh, not necessarily a proliferation, but kind of a further development of turning towards the law in terms of knowledge as well as practice and ways of kind of framing the resistance movement and framing claims and slogans also. Uh, law is just pervasive. Legal challenges, legal frameworks, legal knowledge is just pervasive in everyday conversations. Uh, the last couple of years, especially in Kashmir, the Shopian case kind of gives us a window into that. These conversations are all about the law. So when youth protesters are coming out in the streets and making their demands against the state and engaging in stone pelting, they're talking about the law at the same time. Um, and this is not just something I think that's distinctive to the context of Kashmir. There's been a kind of uh, global um, um, amplification of uh, concepts and consciousness, kind of a transnational legal consciousness of human rights and possibilities of international legal interventions, um, especially since the end of the Cold War. Um, some scholars argue that there's been a shift from community groups asserting their claims in political ways. There's been a shift to an assertion through legal mechanisms and legal claims. So I think that's part of what we see happening here. But it's important not to separate those two things apart too much because the legal claims are also political. And that's kind of the point that I'm trying to really hit home, right? Talking about the law is not just talking about the law. And the ways in which people talk about the law is also localized because it's informed by this history of protest and struggle and movement for self-determination. So talking about the law is also talking about that. To talk about human rights is to talk about a very specific kind of vernacular understanding of human rights within this context. Mm -hmm. So it's not that this started in 2000 there and uh, back in Pakistan from like In 2009, there was a judicial movement, yeah. which was essentially a, a people reaction against the political hegemony and the military establishment, which was like constantly denying them like their share of rights. So, do you see like any inspiration or parallel drawn by the Kashmiris that if like people in Pakistan can fight out the, the military and also the political aristocracy? with a kind of a popular movement centered on constitution, judicial rights, and uh, a long-term like, justice provision. Is there some sort of parallel or inspiration that you have found? That's a, that's a wonderful question. That specifically with the Kashmir Bar Association, with the lawyers who explicitly would talk about how they were modeling their movement on the movement of the Pakistani lawyers in exactly in the way that you're describing. And these photographs actually, um, these photographs of different lawyers from the Bar Association and they're engaging in protests, these actually come from the summer of 2010, which was the summer following the Shopian protest. And there was another kind of wave of protests that happened at this time. Shopian set the stage for it, but it also you know, um, uh, went, in, went in its own direction. And in this, uh, in this phase of the lawyers' movement, they were very, very much drawing inspiration and modeling what they were doing on that, talking about different kinds of strategies and tactics. I mean, these things come up in very specific ways as people sit around in groups and say, should we, ha should we call a strike, right? Should the lawyers call a strike and what should the parameters of that strike be? So they're kind of talking through other cases that they're familiar with and kind of weighing the pros and cons, thinking about different strategies and how it might fit into the larger movement. So yeah, discussions of the lawyers were very pleasant there. Yes. The role of like you know the male and media like you know there is like you know late of 2000 early but I remember Sofian was covered in some like you know in the male and daily based like media and you know mostly I mean it was in Hindi also but in English most like you know there were panel discussion all these things but the media has like you know the proliferation of media also like you know uh, has a role in making a public opinion on like in particular in maintaining public opinion in India in India and like you know also like you know helping 
inside like in Kashmir. Yeah. I think that the national, the mainstream Indian newspapers, there's a, um, there's a complicated way in which those representations enter into the way that things kind of develop and happen in Kashmir, right? So when the, um, and yes, it is all very much connected, right? You have to kind of, I mean, it's going through this material, as I continue going through it, I, I'm continually realizing that I haven't pushed far enough on the role of the national media in affecting and kind of interacting with what's happening on the ground in Kashmir. So when the CBI took up the case in September, the, um, this is just for example, the actual decision, the state government's decision to hand the case over to the, to the um, CBI was prompted by a well-timed, well-placed piece in an English language major news daily that characterized um, the situation in Shopian in a particular way. So reading that from the ground in Kashmir, it seemed as though that was part of a um, process of framing the case in a certain way to justify handing it over to the CBI. Am I making sense? <laughs> so um, that's just one example. And then stories of the progress of the CBI's investigation were, there was a court order restricting um, anyone associated with the case from talking to the media. So there were leaks throughout the fall kind of representing the progress of the CBI investigation in different ways. And before the CBI even submitted its very controversial report saying that there had been no death by drowning and had been no sexual assault, um, that had been leaked uh, at least a week prior, so everyone knew it was coming, right? And those leaks are taking place in the Delhi-based papers. So, um, yeah, I think those, the, the media does play a very important role in kind of framing the ways in which what happens in Kashmir is understood by, um, by constituencies in India. And it often runs really counter to the representations that you see in different news sources in Kashmir. Yeah. Well, I had a question to piggyback um, off the media. The photographs are really quite stunning, though I don't think we can see them because of the light on the screen. Um, do you do you um, do you have people in Kashmir? Oh, thank you. Hey, oh, see, <laughs> ask and you shall get. Um, um, you shall receive whatever. So my question really is: um, Do you have people in Kashmir who send you the, send you these photographs, or are these through news sources, or oh, these are yours? You yeah. were there for my, all. Mm -hmm, my colleague Bruce Hoffman and I. Oh, some okay. of these are his, but some of them are mine. Um, so I was tracking the Shopian case. It's about seven and a half months total on the ground, 2009, 2010, oh, 2011. Okay, I missed that somehow. Um, so. I, don't think I, I don't think I said it. So, so. Okay, so if you could talk a little bit about being there and what was it like, did you feel safe mm -hmm. and? Um, well, I've been, um, I've been doing research as an anthropologist, starting as a grad student, right, right. and now as an anthropologist, um, on issues relating to Kashmir for uh, 12 or 13 years, as, as, as you said. So, um, and especially more intensively in Kashmir Valley over the last, I'll say since 2006. Mm -hmm. um, so across that period of time, I've um, um, met a lot of people and made a lot of um, kind of important connections and contacts. Um, students, uh, people working with different NGOs, members of these different community organizations, right? That have been very kind of uh, supportive and that have made it possible for me to do this kind of research there, because when I'm there, I'm kind of there by myself as a researcher. And I think that um, there are many challenges to doing ethnographic research in Kashmir for someone in my situation. Mm -hmm. um, the primary one of those is, of course, just the intensive militarization and the number of men with guns <laughs> everywhere, kind of saturate, saturating public space throughout the society. So um, yeah, and, and also it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of unpredictable because for instance, I, when I went for my 2009 field work, the Shopian, the crime actually happened between the time that I got on the plane in the United States and got off the plane in Kashmir over like a three day period. I was kind of out of media contact and then when I arrived, it was happening. So it's the kind of thing where you can't really anticipate that that's what you're going to be researching. Um, but then when, it, when things like this have happened, I've just followed, followed them and followed up on them. Does that kind of get at your question? Yeah, so, uh, no, I think that's, I mean, because the pictures were really like in the action and I was wondering who, you know, where they yeah. came from. And so why did you decide to put them in black and white, at least for this presentation and not color? Well, right, it's uh, these black and white ones. I put these together, my colleague and I put these together for a photo essay that we were working on and for a publication, they wanted black and white copies. Oh, okay. And so somehow along the line, I haven't, I wasn't able to come up with the color ones. <laughs> 
but the color ones are actually, of course, much more vibrant than the black and white ones. Um, the colors come across more fully. How's the purism? Because, you know, like, yeah. a stylistic choice. Oh, yeah, some this one. And the grids, we arranged them in grids, and the grids do each tell a different story, right? Oh. So I didn't really go through the telling of the stories that the photos express here. You can kind of pick up on it a little bit, perhaps, by looking at them in some cases. This was one particular protest. This actually took place the day after Human Rights Day. This was, like, two days before the CBI report was released. And this is a... Um, uh, um, uh, it's kind of a, a, um, it's not an atypical kind of street protest. It's one that happened in Mysuma. What was distinctive about this one is that in the course of the street protest, the stone pelting and the firing, uh, these buildings in the marketplace caught fire, went up in flames and were burned down. So then the next day when we went back and we we're kind of exploring the area, the shopkeepers who were there reviewing the damage were pointing out the tear gas canisters that had caused the fire. Um, so that's the story that's being told there. Yeah. Do you personally feel that Kashmir can, you know, eventually become independent? If it's not any feasible or yeah. I think that as an outsider, it's not necessarily. I don't. I sort of. Um, I. I feel that that's not for me to really speculate on or decide. Uh, what gives me, what um, inspires me about the research project that I've been carrying out is the emergence of these local community groups and also the, the, the very powerful discussion and dialogue and negotiation that's constantly happening on the ground as Kashmiris themselves are having these kinds of conversations, right? So there's a lot of discussion about that happening and that's, uh, that's meaningful. Yeah. I, I'm gonna take this in a slightly different direction because I'm just compelled by this. I just finished doing a small research project on the Fatah region in Pakistan. So for those of you who don't know, the federally administrated tribal areas of Pakistan, which are on the Afghani border, do not follow any of the legal constructions of the Pakistani constitution. In fact, the Pakistani constitution says none of our laws are effective here. And you're under the control of a political agent who is your only source of power, unless it's the president of the country. And, and the, but it's an area that's also increasingly militarized because the Pakistanis have now started sending the military in very regularly, although they don't make very far. I mean, we know this is one of the sources. This is where the drones go, for those of you who don't know, and some geographers are actually arguing that the drones can work there only because it is this extra legal territory, mm. which is kind of an interesting piece. But, but what I, what's to me really interesting is we don't get, because there's no legal authority there, there's, there's not even police that have, that there, if, you know, if you get thrown in jail in Fatah, according to what I've been able to read, you have no legal recourse to even lawyers because nothing legal works there. So this is a really interesting, different extra legal situation. Right. And, and these guys, I mean, in Kashmir, it's much more effective because you do have some legal and some civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Fatah, which is even more extra legal, um, you don't have that at all. So I just think it's a really, really interesting right. comparison. Right. I don't know what to make of it beyond of that is my initial thought. I'm thinking of a couple of different things as you're talking. I'd be, it'd be really interesting to know the only way probably to find this out would be through field work, right? But to know what forms of legal authority are informally operating right. on the ground in this because it's, it's in the absence of state law, right? But there would be non-state forms of establishing and maintaining moral order and th well, that are on the ground and those... If you, if you series of different small, mostly conservative right-wing Muslim organizations. Mm -hmm. And they, they are the ones that are controlling the territory. Mm -hmm. They claim the authority to speak on behalf of the community. And I think also what you're pointing at, which, what you're getting to, is that this is part of what is so contradictory and kind of paradoxical in a way, or what is distinctive about the situation here in the Valley is that there is a facade of the law, right? The yeah. court system yeah. it does exist, it is functioning. There's a lower court complex and a high court complex. And one day a week is the day that the Bar Association lawyers take human rights claims before the courts. So they're taking claims against the state to the state's legal complex on those days, right? So it does put the lawyers, this goes back to your comment about the Pakistan lawyers movement, it puts the lawyers in a very interesting position where they reject the political authority of the Indian state in Kashmir, but at the same time, they're working under Indian law in the courtrooms to try to bring human rights cases against the Indian state forward and seek justice. So it's 
And that's why it's also interesting to see those moments where the Bar Association decides that that's not enough and that they need to go out into the streets. In the summer of 2010, it was when they then started going out into the streets and burning their legal robes and um, calling for justice through that kind of popular protest outside of the courtrooms that the, uh, the arrest started, right? Where the president of the Bar Association was arrested on sedition charges and held for eight months, the general secretary as well, which was very experienced as being very demoralizing to the young lawyers who were just trying to kind of start to go into the legal profession. So these dynamics do make it interesting, the fact yeah, that you have a bar association. It's amazingly interesting contrast there. I don't quite know how to put it in words yet. I right. I some more, and I don't have all the evidence. But you do have lawyers working at Peshawar, but I don't think you have it about the third here. So, you know, and both of those are part of the region, and, uh, largely, so. Just to elaborate your point, actually I'm from Pakistan and I have gone to North Pakistan, uh, South Pakistan. I work for Pakistan government. I've served in Chaman, Koita border, et cetera. Why it is different in Pakistan is because when the British left, they had an agreement with the tribal areas. They are not only FATA, there are FATA provincial administrative tribal areas. And area-wise, they cover about half of Pakistan, these tribal areas. So they had an agreement with the British government that the British law will not be applied here. So that was their sort of agreement to accede to the British. So when the state of Pakistan and India were created, so they, uh, the tribal adults said that we are going to follow this law, frontier crime regulation. So it's the reverse, that the government wants that they become the settled area and they, the law of uh, the government uh, of the Pakistan should be applied there. But it's the resistance from the tribals that we will not accept what they called First, they used to call British law, now they call it as a Punjabi law that we will not let you That's establish not the Punjabi. I've been, reading, but so. like, um, European side, I've been reading that they actually would like to have constitutional law there. They, they, they had a popular movement around 2000 to 2004 because they were not satisfied with the authority of the Malik's there, especially in FATA. Not in FATA because FATA has provincial assembly, they can vote for provincial assembly, but FATA can only vote for the national assemblies and the Senate. But the actual is that whenever you want to amend it, so the Constitution says that the effective region, three-fourths of their members should agree, whatever the region is, whether it's a province. So so the, the, those who are at the, in the assembly of the Senate holding the FATA seat, they don't agree. Even if, so the government at present state, it suits the government, so they no longer push it. But like for 50 years, it suited them. So it's a kind of a different this way. Even in the Kashmir situation, like, you know, the Indian constitution, like the 370, like, you know, I mean, India as a center just cannot go and intervene directly, but the case has been made, like, you know, external affair, like, you know, and that's what the military and everything is like, you know, and then they are given a special, you know, this privilege and like, you know, a special law. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, the local administration issue is anymore like, you know, the Kashmir, like, you know, in view of, like, you know, as it is defined in 370, that, but now I think like, you know, so uh, that's what the Indian military and all, everything, I mean, you know, comes into that because it doesn't play anymore, 370 is not like, you know, mm -hmm. being applied at, it's supposed to be like, you know. Yes. One more question and we'll move to the phone. Uh, so just bringing it back to the Shopian case, I just want to know, have you been following the legal case uh, that's been going on now? And then do you think that while, I think in, in many ways one could say that all of these different groups showed great restraint at the time. Uh, Should I? Showed great restraint at the time in terms of not getting too violent or getting completely out of hand in, in some ways. Uh, do you think that the case, whatever the outcome of the case happens, the court case, would that, will it play out again this way or it's, uh, it's something you couldn't speculate on right now? Yeah, well, I mean, the, with the release of the CBI report, that essentially kind of sh shut down, that was essentially you know, closing the door on possibilities for legal justice. There's nowhere to go from that. But there, so what's happening, what's been happening in the court system throughout 2000, um, I mean, since the CBI report came out in December of 2009, so the charges that were brought against the 13 Kashmiris, those are still going through the court system, right? Because, and I don't think any of those, I'm not sure, but those, at least some of those are still going on. Um, and then also uh, one of the family members, Shaquille, who you'll see in the film in a few minutes, um, Shaquille has petitioned the government to open a new inquiry into the case through a very, very powerful petition. These legal documents have such rhetorical force and power, right? Through a powerful petition 
saying that the CBI inquiry was illegitimate. Um, so those may go somewhere across time, they may not, but they're not really seen as, um, I don't really think that they will open up a new kind of investigation into the Shopian, into the Shopian case, right? Um, because the CBI report is kind of, is, is very powerful and very definitive. So at this point, the kind of possibilities for adjudication are happening in these extra state forums, you know? Um, I don't necessarily. I don't necessarily think that uh, any future developments in the Shopian case will cause a massive kind of uprising, is that, which is kind of what you were asking. I think that um, though the kind of implication of it is that it was, you know, the way that many people expressed it was that it was not surprising that they hadn't gotten justice in this case, but that they had kind of been viewing it as a litmus test because it was a case that wasn't really related to the militancy at all. It was seen as an everyday crime by state actors. And so if the state couldn't even deliver justice in this kind of case, then what hope was there for any justice in any kind of case? So I, I do think it had a very demoralizing effect and then kind of forced a lot of groups to kind of recalibrate their understanding of what the possibilities were. And then that will feed into other kinds of episodes in the future. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. This is when the Adam was thrown out of the uh, heaven. It was not only the Adam in person he was thrown out of, but the piece of land also there was thrown out of the heaven. There are people who say that that piece of land is cashmere.